Of course. Well, thank you for joining me today. Um, I turned off comments because I realized on Instagram, the comments cover up the speaker's face. And I want people to be able to see you and hear you and, you know, as we're discussing. So thank you very much for joining me today. Yeah, of course. So I want to start off by reading your bio, Willie. It's, you're quite accomplished. Everyone knows um, that you are a prolific poet and author and you've um, been repping New York very well and very inspiring all of your uh, works. Um, so I'd like to uh, share that. Willie Perdomo is the author of The Great, The Crazy Bunch, winner of the 2019 to 2020 New York Society of Libraries New York City Book Award, The Essential Hits of Shorty Bon Bon, a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award, Smoking Lovely, winner of the Pen Open Book Award, and Wear a Nickel Costs a Dime, a finalist for the Poetry Society of America Norma Farber First Book Award, he is also a co-editor of the Breakbeat Poetry Series Anthology, Latinx. His work has appeared in the New York Times Magazine, Poetry, The Best of American Poetry 2019, and African Voices. He is currently a Lucas Arts Literary Fellow and teaches at Phillips Exeter Academy. So I just want to congratulate you on your latest release, Latinx, and I'm so excited to talk with you about the anthology today. Thank you. And so, uh, Willie, I'd love to ask you, what was your inspiration um, for the anthology? I understand that it's in a series um, of, of poetry anthologies offered to the literary community. And so I just wanted to hear from you um, what was your inspiration and the meaning for you behind the anthology? Well, you know, I, I wanted to, at some point in my writing life, venture out into being an, an anthologist and kind of collecting other voices. I think, you know, one of my, uh, a memory that I had of, of being a young, young uh, poet, almost in my early 20s or late teens, if I remember, uh, in the 125th Street uh, New York Public Library. And I remember going to, uh, I had just started working on where nickel costs a dime. And I would usually go into the library just to, to read. And definitely in the summers just to cool off. But um, there was an anthology by a guy named Arnold Ardoff, I think was his name. And it had a real generic title, like 20th Century Black American <laughs> Poetry, something like that, I remember. And um, I found a poem by uh, Langston Hughes called Prime. And there's a uh, there's a there's a line where he says, "Uptown in the section of he uses the N word at the end, uh, where nickel costs a dime." And I remember seeing it, and I it was like one of those movies where everything is kind of blacked out, and it was just like lit. The line was lit. I was like, "Where nickel costs a dime?" That's going to be the title of the book, you know. And I found it, uh, and anthology gave me that. There were anthologies like uh, New Eureka Poetry, the original one that was edited by Miguel Pinero and um, yeah. uh, Miguel Agarín. That that was a groundbreaker for me. Dudley Randall's uh, uh, The Black Poet. The Black which, Poets yeah, Anthology. Yeah, 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 very, very. That was a groundbreaker for me as well. And I don't, I don't recall how much of there what there was an introduction there, but he pretty much just let all the poetry do the work, right? So I'm thinking about you know how to bring you know, the, the, the anthologies that, that inspired me to Latinx. So when Kevin Colville, uh, when Kevin Colville um, approached me so a few years back, says, would I be interested in doing this breakbeat book uh, with Jose? And I don't know if Felicia was, uh, uh, Rose Chavez was on board at that point, but later on, um, she became part, she was part of the team, a very influential part of the team as well. Um, and so, you know, it had to be within the breakbeat aesthetic. It had to have a level of hip hop poetics. It had to have, I think, a range of voices that were intergenerational. Um, it had to have a range of aesthetics. So there was, it wasn't just one note. And I think one of the primary things that we were we were concentrating on was that it had to be then a level of inclusivity as well. Uh, and then to what extent were we exploring, um, you know, being Latinx, but also being 
African American, uh, being from the Caribbean, yeah. being from the diaspora. So all these things kind of, you know, um, went into making uh, Latinx. So we were very intentional, very specific. I think the only, you know, the the only drawback, I think the only thing that I, I suppose to bemoan was that we just, that we couldn't include all the poets that, that submitted. And that's going to be right. a problem that any anthologist is mm -hmm. going to have. So, yeah. For sure. And it's certainly a... Um, it's beautiful. I notice the themes of social justice uh, that are weaved throughout the anthology. Um, certainly um, poets from representing, as you mentioned, the Caribbean, um, Latinx background, African American from all over the country, of course, representing different regions. And so I want to also hone in on something that you said in your note um, in the anthology that really struck me um, as your uh, talking about what I perceive to be not only the history, as you mentioned, um, of uh, the poets and, and heading into um, doing this anthology with, and the different influences that you've had, your travels. You mentioned Pablo Neruda. You also mentioned traveling to Chile and many of the poets um, that you've been inspired by working with and contributors um, in the anthology. Um, but there's something that struck, struck me being from the hip hop generation um, myself. And you stated the Breakbeat Poetry series offers a poetics that like hip hop is in constant search of new forms, new utterances, new languages, freshness. And I really love that because it really bridges, as you mentioned, um, different generations and those of us who understand how music influences poetry can really relate to that. So I wanted to ask you, can you talk about um, mu musical influences and how that kind of uh, brings that uh, musical culture into uh, the poetry in this work and certainly in your own work um, as a poet? Yeah, I think, I mean, I can probably speak more for my own work than a lot of the work that's in the anthology for sure, right? But sure. I mean, if we start with the anthology, you'll see that, um, you know, the 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 range of approaches to poetics is pretty wide, right? So that means that, in other words, that there's room for um, someone like, say, Anthony Morales, who's probably influenced by uh, Big Pun, to someone like Malcolm Friend, who is has uh, inserts um, Maelo, uh, Ishmael Herrera, who's a salsa singer, right? So what you're looking at is kind of this this mess, this this mix at that point. For me. You know, I started writing poems and reading poems, I think, in the early 90s. And this was right about the time that the Native Tongue Movement was about to, to, to grow and explode. And it had a big influence on poets of my generation, right? So you were looking at uh, groups like a tribe called Quest. They were kind of, they were still urban. They were still, you know, had their eye to the street. But they were also involved in using jazz as a way to, you know, uh, heighten the sound a little bit. They were... Uh, thinking in abstracts, right? Uh, you're kind of dissuaded from using abstraction when you write poetry because it's supposed to be specific and concrete. But, you know, I mean, those kind of groups from the native tongue were kind of forcing us to think things on different levels, on metaphysical levels, on uh, concrete levels, on uh, social justice level, to definitely be conscious, right? Um, so if I take that influence of hip hop, I take the improvis improvis improvisation of jazz, I take the um, the, uh, the 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 song of a of a of a of a salsa track, and thinking to myself, all these things are really a part of my library, right? They're just as part of my library as the books that I'm reading at the time that I'm writing. Um, so uh, how much of that influences me, you know, to to some extent, I can. I can say consciously that there is an influence, but a lot of that stuff is coming through my dreams anyway. A lot of it is coming through, you know, memories that I have uh, that are sure. connected to specific soundtracks, right? So when I wrote The Crazy Bunch, I had a whole soundtrack. In fact, um, DJ uh, Jibo, who was also, who's also from uh, East Harlem, I asked him to put, you know, tracks to it, and he came one track after another, after another, after another, and all of them were on point because we came up during the same time, right? So you had everything from freestyle to uh, hip hop in in the playlist that he put together, which was exactly what I was thinking about 
when I'm writing the book. Oh, when I wrote the book, rather, yeah. That's wonderful. And so the anthology, I know that this is something that, you know, it's not overnight. It doesn't happen in a month. Um, can you talk to me about, you know, what the process was, the time range, um, your process in, um, well, maybe not selecting, but, you know, what, what were your thoughts as you were curating um, and um, the time range of just bringing it to fruition? Yeah, I think it was about a year all together. So I'm thinking the book came out in April. We were in real heavy discussions during the summer. I was in residence as um, in, at the Montavo Art Center, the Lucas mm -hmm. Arts Literary Fellow. And uh, so I was taking most of the calls up there and working on the anthology with Jose, with Felicia. And we were talking about the demographics of the contributors. We were talking about the regional imbalance of the contributions. Felicia was very influential in kind of checking us that way in terms of how are we balanced regionally here? You know, uh, I think that was important uh, um, in terms of the conversation. So we started collecting um, we, the, the, the submissions. We started going through the submissions. And because we had the Loteria cards as a kind of scaffold for it, it helped as to where certain poems would go. Mm. So that was important, right? That was a major, major uh, uh, factor in terms of how we were approaching uh, where the poems were going to be placed. Who, yeah, go for it. Can you elaborate on that, please? Yeah. So the, so the Loteria cars kind of have these thematic uh, qualities to them. Uh, death. Uh, sirens music, uh, culture. So we saw where the poets were, what the poets were writing to that we selected, and then we kind of placed them accordingly within those sections. Wow. Uh, the other thing is, is um, who was going to start off the section and who was going to end off the section, right? So it's like putting an album together. You know, you got to have a good cut coming out yeah. at the beginning <laughs> and have, have a, a good cut on the outro as well, right? So that was right. part of it. So there were a few factors that we were thinking about uh, when we were putting the book together. Um, but the, 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 the sectionalization of the book was key in how we started placing the poems. Wonderful. And you mentioned early on about the uh, making sure that there was a balance of the intergenerations. And, you know, I've often in seen in your work, you, you have referenced um, many of the other poets who've come before you, Miguel, Miguel uh, Algarin, and you've mentioned Amiri Baraka, and I know you've had a number of influence. How important was that for you to kind of see that these generations are talking to each other and you're continuing to bring up the new um, generation of poets, their voices and what they care about um, in sort of a conversation with uh, poets who have, you know, been here and been doing this work for a long time. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts about that in terms of the anthology? I think that if you look at any poetry book, or if you, you look at any anthology, any, any, any collection of poems, you could look at a collection of poems that says this book has a lineage. It has a tradition. And sometimes we kind of fail to honor that lineage. We forget the traditions from, from whence we come, right? So I think it was important to, to, to honor the, uh, the influences that came through. As an anthologist, certainly the anthologies that I mentioned, those were just a few of them. Um, that was a way to me, for me to honor those anthologies that have major, major impact on, on my writing as well. Because I usually will tell a young poet, look, go to an anthology before you go to a single collection. And when you go to an anthology, what you'll find is poets that you might want to pursue further, right? Sure. And, so, and so that's part of the anthology process as a reader, but it's also, uh, you know, part of the process as, as, as a person who's kind of putting it together as part of a team. There are some poets in the book right now that I want to follow mm. as a result. Yeah. Right? right. So, but I think it's important to kind of be able to trace a lineage. So I'm always shouting out someone like Baraka, but I'm always shouting out someone 
uh, like Raymond R. Patterson, who was a big mentor of mine, right? And the way he approached writing through a kind of blues lens, right? So that's something that was impactful for me uh, going forward. Um, you know, I, I think that it's vital for uh, a poet to kind of recognize what came before in order for you to say, okay, I'm ready to move on now. I, I seen that, I accepted that, that had a big impact on me, but I'm on to this new thing right now and uh, I'm gonna walk this path, but I won't forget uh, where, 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 you, where I came from. That's beautiful. And Willie, talk to me about, you know, there has been, um, in the last, of course, several years, we've seen um, really an uptake of literature that speaks to social justice awareness and many of the things that um, have uh, impacted communities of black and brown people. And so I'd like to ask you, in what ways do you feel that the anthology kind of addresses some of those topics and issues that we're all uh, grappling with? Or what are next steps for our literature and our poetry um, to continue to address those issues and, and topics? Oh yeah, you can you can pretty much close your eyes and just you know put your finger on a, on the table of content and find a poet who's addressing uh, the binary, who's addressing being queer, who's addressing being trans, who's addressing being multiracial, who is addressing gentrification, who's addressing oppression, who's address, addressing um, immigration, uh, who is celebrating family, who is also not losing sight of our collective joy. I think what you're going to see going forward is how writers are going to respond to uh, COVID-19, to writing uh, in confined, space, confined spaces, to um, trying to contextualize this moment in a political kind of historical way. You're going to see um, writers responding to it. And you're going to see it through either journals, you're going to see it through films, you're seeing it now on Instagram and, and Facebook in terms of the photos that pop up. So the poetry is about to follow in that regard. Okay. The narratives are about to follow, I think. Um, and I don't think the, that the poets, by any means, uh, you know, given COVID or not, will lose sight of their own struggles. Right. Uh, you, we need witnesses. Uh, we need recordings. We need documentation for the time that we live in. Do we want to put pressure on a poem for that? Not necessarily, but the poem is going to do it anyway. Right. Yeah. And so you mentioned one of something that I was going to bring up. How did how do you feel that not necessarily with the anthology, because this has already just been released, but in terms of your own writing and work and, and what you see as maybe some of the struggles that writers, poets may be facing now, um, how does being quarantined impact um, your creativity, your writing, and even your ability to connect with others in the community? The irony is that I've been connecting a lot more with you know, <laughs> folks that I haven't talked to in a while because of you know, yeah. the being in quarantine. So Zoom has been, you know, a major, major Amazing. tool. So on Fridays, I get together with some of my old college friends and, you know, we'll have a drink and, and, and have fun. I went to a, a little birthday celebration yesterday. It was brief, but I went to a birthday celebration yesterday. On Zoom, is that yeah, on, on Zoom? Zoom okay. Of course, yeah, yeah. So, so that's part of it. I think, you know, the, it's going to be difficult, I think, for poets and writers and artists to really produce at a time like this because you have a lot of poets and writers who are kind of worried about how to make a living. Certainly. So if they're freelance artists, if they're gig artists, if they're, you know, uh, if they count on being on the road, if they count on the fellowships, if they count on the grants, it's going to be very, very difficult. But what happens at a time like that is then, then the writing starts to take on a little bit more urgency. Mm. Right? So you are in a position where you might you might be writing fast or you might be writing angry or you might be writing scared. You out of place of fear. You might be writing out of a, a of a, you know, not knowing if the next day is going to be promised. So if that's the case, then you have to put it on the line. Right. In right. that moment. Um, so I, I think we're going to see some powerful, powerful work come out of there. Already you're looking at folks who are keeping journals right now 
who are on the front line. That work is going to be yeah. powerful. The photographs that are coming from that. But in terms of the written word, we've already, we've had uh, a plethora of, of dystopian literature that kind of seen this moment. But the aftermath, right, the, 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 the narratives that are written by the survivors, that's going to be the story that we kind of need to, to pass on, right? So I think that's important uh, in terms of what, how the writing is going to, to change, uh, how the writing is going to kind of cast a lens on what we are experiencing. And then the idea of what does it actually mean now to live in this country and be free, right? That is something that is up for grabs now, the conversation, because a lot of our liberties, quote unquote, our freedoms have been limited, restricted, right? So how to write within that space is something that I, I find really interesting. I love that you said that, Willie, and you, to me, you, it's like in those statements, you just gave us hope. Um, for anyone who might be battling with um, a depression right now and the feeling of anxiety because of the cert uncertainty, um, and certainly artists being um, very sensitive people, you know, we feel everything, we see everything. Um, I really appreciate that you mentioned, you know, we're going to see some powerful work come out of this. There are people journaling, there are people scribing what they're seeing and what they're feeling and what they're going through. And, and I really feel like that statement right there gives people hope. Um, so I want to thank you for that. I appreciate that. Um, and so I want to ask you, going back to your anthology, Latinx, and if you're just joining us, we're talking about uh, Willie Perdomo's new work, Latinx, a breakbeat poets anthology. And it's a beautiful work that was just released um, in um, April. Um, Willie, what are your thoughts about how the anthology can be used uh, teaching poetry or teaching um, literature, multicultural literature, uh, diverse voices in high school or college um, for educators? Yeah, I think the book is going to be very, very useful uh, in working with ESL students. It's going to be useful in working with immigrant students. It's going to be useful in working with students from who parents are from the diaspora, but uh, from the from their native lands, if you will, but who were born in in, in the diaspora, right? So, um, you know, I, I keep thinking about a visit I made to a school. Uh, I think it was in Chicago, and uh, and most of the students in the classroom were either African American or Latinx, but the teacher was teaching Ozymandias, Ozymandias, right? And I, I couldn't understand why, if I'm in Chicago and Gwendolyn Brooks is from Chicago, why are we not teaching Gwendolyn Brooks before we're teaching right. this kind of classical, you know, white male, mm -hmm. you know, poem? Right. Um, and so at that point, as a teacher, I would have, I would probably take out Latinx and be like, all right, cool, let's let's look at some of the poems in in this book and let's look at some of the sections and see how we can work with it. Basically what I'm saying at this point is that that student, that Latinx student in the classroom, however they identify, whether they identify as black or identify as white or identify as trans or identify, um, you know, as, as multiracial will find themselves in the collection. And when they zoom in on that one particular poem that'll kind of break the world wide open for them, the hope is that one, they'll keep reading, and two, that they'll pick up their own notebooks and say, wow, I think I, you know, I might want to write a poem about my experience living in Chicago uh, as a Latinx young male, right? So that's the hope. So I think it's going to be useful uh, in terms of holding up uh, somewhat of a mirror to uh, the experiences of young readers and adult readers alike, you know, in yeah. colleges. Yeah. And I love that because what you're talking about, um, Willie, is what we often discuss in education, which is culturally responsive teaching, using culturally responsive texts, um, being an educator who's supporting inclusivity and helping students see themselves reflected in the literature, which I feel like is so important. And I really see your anthology as being uh, able to um, 
kind of be a central text for a course. And, you know, I'm an English educator, so I'm always thinking about those kinds of things, mm -hmm. being a central text for a course, and then working in some other uh, pieces um, to certainly teach a number of things, not just Lat Latinx literature, but as you mentioned, um, what does it look like to be, you know, regionally specific or however you identify uh, gender-wise or politically, um, that this collection, it has so much in it um, that I think will be of great value for educators and students all over. And so, um, Willie, I want to ask you right now, is there anything in particular you'd like to read or touch upon from the anthology, what you would like your audience and readers to know further? I think, I mean, I, I wouldn't want to single out any po po poem from, from the anthology. Yeah, at that's point, tough. But I think, you know, I think it's important that if we are in a situation where we're thinking and we're saying to ourselves, to our teachers, to uh, our community centers, to our libraries, there's not enough, you know, representation in our curriculum. There's not enough representation on our shelves. Um, well, here you have it. And this is just a blip of really of what's out there, right? Because there's a larger, larger group of poets who are producing right now. And the hope is that someone else will come along and put another anthology of Latinx writers, you know? Um, so I think that's where, my, that's my primary hope that, you know, where you saw a dearth of voices, now you're seeing a blooming, like a blossoming of those voices. And, you know, these anthologies, they've been around, but they come few and far between. Sure. You know? Um, and I think this one is speaking to its time. Certainly, it comes at the right time. And, you know, Willie, I know that you are always working on uh, something great, and you have just finished or currently in a residency. And so what's next for you? Can you talk about what you're currently working on um, as a poet, as a writer? You know, I'm not superstitious, but I, don't, I, I <laughs> certainly don't like to talk about what I'm working on. Okay. <laughs> uh, you know, but I can tell you that the, the being in quarantine has, and, you know, being stay at home, rather, um, has been, the silver lining is that I've been pretty productive and, uh, you know, in as much as, you know, I have a, a prose project right now that I'm putting in 1,000 words a day on and I'm, wow. putting, I'm being consistent with that. Now, granted, those 1,000 words, like most of it is shit, but there's there's little parts that you're kind of pulling out. Oh, like, yeah, you're going to pull those out. <laughs> yeah, I can run with this, you know. <laughs> I can, I can run with this. So I'm doing a thousand words a day on one project, and then I have a short form project that's almost done. So I've been I've been busy, but without being too specific. And I just sure. you know once once you come out with a book, I had a I had a book come out last April, the Crazy Bunch. The and Crazy I Bunch. Had this book. So I'm, I'm I'm running a nice little groove, April groove. You're right looking now. like you you know one a year. <laughs> you're, you're, gonna, you're gonna do that. Running, you keep going for that. Yeah. Every time a book comes out, I give myself at least a month or two just to just chill, you know and kind of enjoy it and then I get a little angsty and be like all right it's time to get back to work it's time to get back yeah. and so what's interesting about now is you gonna chill indefinitely <laughs> uh, well yeah I mean I still have to work I'm a teacher so you know I have to do that work as well but you know the term is almost over and right now you know you can feel as a writer when you kind of in a good groove you know and yeah. you're kind of coming back for more that's always a good place to be I think you know and that's about as much as I can say about that, yeah. Sure. Yeah. And how about the balance of being an educator and having, you know, summers and some of those breaks? How does that meet well with your with your creativity? You know, I, I'm fortunate that I work at a school that really values writing and values letters and the literary arts and so on. So, you know, as a writer who teaches, I'm, I'm in a good place uh, in that respect. Um, you know, it's interesting to see how your writing might inform, your teaching might inform your writing. So I've been, I teach a lot of prose now, so I'm, I'm kind of moving in that direction. I think most people who would read my work would find no surprise at all in that right. respect, you know what I'm saying? But, mm -hmm. um, you know, the idea of exchanging, idea, uh, uh, of exchanging concepts and 
theory and ideas with students who are highly motivated, highly intelligent, it keeps you on your toes, basically. There's some stuff that you want to introduce that's brand new and innovative. And what you find often is that they introduce the innovation to you. So that's the kind of joy I find in, in teaching. And, you know, the summers are there to balance off. So I'll, you know, go out to Montalvo for a month. That won't happen this summer. But, you know, having those spaces away from what you call your regular life, I think, is really, really important where you shut off the phone from 9 to 5, 9 to 12. You have some lunch and then, you know, work. That's that's a privilege, right? Yeah. But even if you don't have that, I think it's important to really create that, what I like to call a dream space that no one can really impose on from family on down. So you close the door, you shut the phone off, and you get to work, you know? Uh, and it's, it's for me, it's always been like that. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. And, you know, Willie, what are you listening to in those times? Are you listening to music? Oh, I'm listening to a lot of music. I'm listening to Jerry Gonzalez in the Ford Apache band right now. He has an okay. album called Moliendo that was really, really good that I'm enjoying. Um, I'm listening to Tad Dameron, album called Mating Call, which I really love. Um, I've, been I've been listening to a kid named Saba out of Chicago on the hip hop. And I, 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 uh, I teach a course called Beats, Rhymes, and Narratives. So the kids... Oh, wow. Are they constantly bring in new artists to the full. Because, you know, I'm steady coming with my Tribe Called Quest. And they're like, all right. Of you know, course. And they're bringing, they're bringing new artists into the fold. And so I'm learning a lot about, you know, contemporary hip-hop uh, through my students and my teenage son as well. Um, so, you know, jazz and hip-hop for the most are pretty much on loop uh, as I work. Wonderful. And so, you know, can you share uh, your favorite hip-hop artists, maybe three to five? Uh oh, that's a big question. Uh, I, it's something I've been wanting to. Call all right, I would go. With... I would go with a tribe called Quest. Okay. I would go with Rock Him. Nice. I would go with Nas. For sure. I would put. I'm battling right now between Roxanne Shante Shante and uh, uh, MC Light and MC Light. Oh, love. Yeah, Hulk. yeah, yeah. And then um, one more big pun. Okay, all right. <laughs> the Bronx. You gotta have the Bronx. All right. Cool, cool. I kind of put you on the spot with that one. one. But you 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 know your you know your hip hop so I know I, I know I know some of it I'm, I know some of it yeah yeah so Willie where can we uh, other than IG you're here at Willie Perdomo on IG where can we follow you and certainly where can um, the audience pick up a copy of Latinx a Breakbeat Poets anthology yeah so for my social networking it's willie perdomo across the board so twitter facebook and instagram i would highly highly um recommend and i would love for folks who really are interested in getting this book to go straight to haymarket books okay um so you know all you have to do is punch in haymarketbooks.com we had a fabulous lunch uh launch uh last i think a week and a half ago i think it's on their site as well Okay. Uh, so if you want and are interested in purchasing the book, please go to Haymarket Books. And uh, and again, this is just not my book. It's This book belongs to Jose Olivares, and it belongs to Felicia Rose Chavez and the entire Latinx community. So Thank you for that. And congratulations again to you, to right on. your co-editors and all of the contributors. It's a beautiful work, and I look forward to sharing it in my classroom as well. Right on. Thank you. And so thank you, uh, Willie, so much for joining me today. Um, power and peace to your writing hand. Continue creative blessings for you. And uh, look forward to staying in touch and seeing what else uh, that you are producing. Likewise. Bless up to you. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you. And take care. All right. Peace. Okay.